we are again. My name is Sawika Colbert. I'm a Vicino faculty and Idol family professor in the Department of Performing Arts and African American Studies. It pains me that we gather under the context of COVID and the ongoing structural violence of anti-Black racism. But we are here in the tradition of teach-ins as a part of social movements for change. I would like to thank the Dean of the College, Chris Chalenza, for his leadership and clear-sighted ethical vision for the college. I would also like to thank Vice Deans, Elena Silva and David Edelstein for suggesting that we convene this discussion. I am pleased to be joined by Zandria Robinson, Associate Professor of African American Studies and award-winning author of This Ain't Chicago, Race, Class, and Regional Identity in the Post-Soul South, and co-author of Chocolate Cities, The Black Map of American Life. Our second panelist is Michael Kazin, professor of history and co-editor of the magazine Descent. He is also an award-winning author and it has written American Dreamers, How the Left Changed the Nation, and War Against, the, war, against war, the American Fight for Peace. He is also the co-author of America Divided, the Civil War of the 1960s. Our next panelist, Olufemi Taiwo, is an assistant professor of philosophy and is the author of the forthcoming book, Reconsidering Reparations. Finally, Robert Patterson is a professor of African American studies and author of Exodus Politics, Civil Rights and Leadership in African American Literature and Culture and Destructive Desires, Rhythm and Blues Culture and the Politics of Racial Equity, Equality. He is also the co-editor of The Psychic Hold of Slavery. We are excited to have this conversation with you and we are gonna take a little bit of time at the beginning to have a conversation that I will moderate, but we will also take questions from the audience at the end of our discussion. So please post your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and I will be sure to pose them to the panelists once we've begun, we finished our round table discussion. So my first question is to Zandria and Michael. Many people have compared this moment to 1968 and um, the world changing protests that occurred during the civil rights movement. I wonder what about this moment is similar to 1968 and what we can learn from that historical comparison. So maybe let's begin with Zandria and then Michael, please respond. I think the thing about 1968 is that it was a hot point, flashpoint moment that was preceded by several other riots, uprisings, rebellions in the years previous. And we can trace these uh, in many ways, but I'm thinking of the 1965 Watts riots in particular, and there were smaller riots in between there, and then 1968. And so if we think about this moment today, we can think about uprisings that happened that led up to this moment in Ferguson, in Baltimore, and in cities across the country in response to um, anti-Black violence, police brutality, murder, racism. And so that's one of the things that to think about about 1968 is that it was precipitated by a lot of other things just as this moment is today. And the other thing that I'm witnessing um, from Memphis and 1968 was when King was assassinated here is that the energy in my hometown, like a lot of cities across the country, is very much one that is hopeful. It is rageful. It is desirous of change and not just reform but complete change and undoing of systems of oppression and there's a significant amount of pushback um, to that as well. Thank you. And Michael? Oh you need to unmute. Okay. Uh, thanks. Um, I endorse everything Zandria said. You know, I'm, I'm the only panelist here, I think, who was alive in 68, in fact, was, was going to protest back then. Um, but I'll, I'll leave off the autobiography there. Um, you know, I think one of the big differences um, is that in 68, um, the demonstrations were against a democratic and pretty liberal administration, um, Lyndon Johnson, which was, 
you know, um, had allied itself, at least with the uh, mainstream of the Black Freedom Movement, uh, the 64 Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act of 65. Um, uh, but there clearly was also prosecuting a near genocidal war in Vietnam. And there was a, a general revolt against um, liberalism, I think. Um, whereas now, of course, we have a very conservative president. Um, and the opposition to him is uh, many ways broader, I think, um, uh, than it was in 1968. But we'll have to see what happens uh, this fall. Um, I think another uh, interesting difference, uh, and I've just been reading recent polls. There was one out today from Monmouth University, which is, people follow this kind of thing, says a pretty good poll, which says the majority of Americans, including the majority of white Americans, uh, believe that uh, the anger of uh, black people um, because of Floyd's murder and other murders of black people by the police uh, is justified. That was not true in 1968. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr., who of course now has a you know, monument uh, near the mall, uh, national holiday named after him, was not a popular figure among white Americans, uh, except for a few months in 1963, 64 among white Americans. And so, you know, maybe as a white person, I should be saying this, but I think um, the views of a lot of white people have changed, you know, at least about um, the role of the police. Um, and you see that in these demonstrations, I think. Um, sometimes violent, sometimes not, that have been taking place the last few days. Uh, that they're, they're, you know, predominantly African American, but a lot more people of different races uh, than would have been there in um, the uh, demonstrations slash rebellions that took place in Watts, in, in Detroit, in um, Newark, and uh, of course the country after King's assassination in 68. So that's an important difference, I think. Thank you. Um, and along the lines of thinking historically, I wonder, um, Robert and Femi, if you could talk some about what distinguishes this, distinguishes this moment from other historical moments and how the two uh, main points of reference in our title, COVID and the anti-Black state violence, um, might help us to think about this moment in really particular ways. So Robert, would you please begin and then Femi? Yes, thank you, uh, Salika. I think I'll begin by, if, if it's appropriate, maybe answer the first part of the question, let me answer the first part of the question, then go to the second part of the question. So part of what to me seems to be at stake and the differences in the historical moments are marked, at least in one way, um, those differences are marked by the legislative achievements of the civil rights movement, which is a way to say and to think about you know, during the 1940s, the 1950s, and up into the early and mid-1960s, one of the uh, civil rights goals that was very, very explicit was the eradication of Jim Crow segregation that had been legalized and popularized through the Plessy versus Ferguson decision. And so the movement toward civil rights uh, was always about more than the judiciary, but the judiciary itself became a main venue and place by which to obtain quote unquote equality. And so part of what I think happens in the uh, Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Acts of 65, the Economic and Housing Acts of 68, is that when we have the legal removal of explicit discrimination, uh, there's some thinking perhaps that with the stroke of a pen, with the signing of legislation, the cumulative effects of that discrimination are eradicated and that there is a level playing field that is just created through, through the law. So on the one hand, the law itself has always had an important role in the enfranchisement and in a lot of ways the disenfranchisement of Black people. And so I think that that actually, that the legal shift is actually a, an important and noticeable difference because part of what then happens is going forward is that those achievements, um, which are important, then get turned on their head as a way to further justify and explain Black inequality. And so part of what we have going into the 70s is, are these movements towards um, race neutrality, towards colorblindness, towards this assault that Michael uh, just referenced, this assault on sort of the unrest, right? So there's, not, there's a thinking that at this point, Black, people, black people's uh, gripes and their anger and their frustration with the incremental and very slow movement um, towards economic, political, and other forms of equity, and not simply equality or access, uh, that those become 
thought of as being, you know, out of place, right? Black people, what more do you want? You have equality through the law. But we know that there are limits to that equality uh, because number one, not only uh, do the legal changes, uh, they importantly mitigate who has access, but they don't reverse the cumulative effect of the lack of access that precedes it. So that's number one. And number two, as I always like to talk about in classes when I'm teaching and my students are thinking energetically about solutions, you can legislate law, but you can't legislate feelings. And so those changes in law did not necessarily undo the feelings of uh, anti-Black racism as they were implemented in one-on-one -on -one interactions and institutions. Uh, and so I think that in the past, you could fight against something very specific, which were discriminatory laws. In the post-civil rights era, meaning after those legislative achievements have happened, you don't have those explicit forms of discrimination, which then make it, in some people's mind, harder to fight against, and you don't have the same legal tools that you had um, pre the passage of those acts. Thank you. Femi, comparing now versus then and what's distinctive about this moment? Yeah, there are two broad things that seem to me distinctive about this moment. And the first one follows, I think, fairly directly um, from what Robert just finished explaining. Um, so on the one hand, um, as Robert said, you have a kind of erosion of some of the tools of anti-discrimination that were used to challenge previous structures of injustice like Jim Crow. And at the same time, over the decades since 1968, you've seen um, a wild and rapid expansion in structural forms of um, legislation and the alignment of incentives that encourage militarization of the police and um, mass incarceration, both of which might be, you know, if you write them down on pieces of paper, non-discriminatory, but both of which function in anti-Black fashions. There's the 1033 program, which transfers excess military equipment to civilian law enforcement agencies. Um, there's prison gerrymandering, which is um, downstream of how the US Census Bureau counts people. So it counts um, incarcerated, incarcerated people as residents of the place where they're incarcerated, which increases the political power of the locality that hosts the prisons, which encourages um, legislators and even voters to want incarceration. Um, and the broader political backdrop against which these laws are developing is the fact that the militarization of police and mass incarceration are a bipartisan consensus. So historian Elizabeth Hinton actually traces the key moments in the development of both the militarization of police and mass incarceration to actually Democrat Lyndon Johnson's um, administration, which, um, you know, Michael points out rightfully is far more liberal than the current administration, but nevertheless set the groundwork for a lot of these legal trends. Um, the fact is that at the nation, national level, at the state level, at the local level, all of these policies and the administration of police departments and the administration of prisons, all of these policies have been administered in red, blue, and purple states by Democrats and by Republicans. State violence has no opposition party. So all of that's what's happening in national politics. But I think the, back, the global backdrop really frames the starkest difference between 68 and now. In 1946, there were 35 countries that were member states of the United Nations. And by 1970, that number had ballooned to 127. What happened was the anti-colonial struggles of much of the world, including almost the entirety of the African continent. Um, and the 60s, um, uprisings that happened here happened in full awareness with and dialogue with and arguably, you know, if you believe James Baldwin, in response to um, anti-colonial liberation movements happening in the rest of the world. Um, but, you know, 
we don't tend to frame our politics and our understanding of police violence globally these days, even though many of the literal equipments um, and of course the militarization and police tactics that are being used on protesters now um, and on black and brown communities uh, before and after protests come from Iraq and Afghanistan and Vietnam and AFRICOM and US military adventurism in the, Korean, in the Caribbean. Um, so I think the big change is that politics is more global than ever, but the way that we think about politics is perhaps less global than in the 60s. Thanks, Femi. Um, and I just want to say we should always believe James Baldwin. Um, I think Robert <laughs> wants to jump in with a little bit more on this I, question. I am. Um, just echoing, I, I want to return to something specific that uh, Femi said coming out of the Johnson administration into the Nixon administration that then gets played out and in, in magnified in the Reagan administration. And that is this, the, this issue about law and order. So the, the, the militarization of the police was in many respects direct response to the social um, revolution somebody else might use upheaval unrest of the late 1960s and that and, and that that was racialized so it wasn't that it was happenstance and anyone who has seen Eva DuVernay's um, 13 you know makes it a point she interviews I forget the at this moment the uh, administrator who then who was in the uh, in the Nixon administration who basically said because of the successes of the civil rights movement there were certain code words you could not say and so then instead, they would use inner city, urban, busing. They would use these ideas and these metaphors that were you know, implicitly, explicitly referring to race as a way to kind of garner, to garner support and buy in into this, into this militarization. And so the whole idea of broken, um, broken, broken windows policing that comes out of this moment, this whole idea of um, you know, you're, you're trying to deter larger crimes by harassing people for quote unquote smaller crimes, that that was racialized. And then this plays out in, start, in, in stop and frisk. And what I think is distinct about this moment of, of policing is I think black people for a long time have been very much aware of this, but I do think that the cultural and historical work that documentaries such as 13th are performing, I think the fact that we're coming out of a pandemic where people have been at home, they've been inside. So these are not images that they're just catching on the news at 8 p.m. These are not images that are just flashing um, on a, a feed on their phone, but these are images that they're seeing all day and, then, and that they can sort of think about how, how does the inequality that is happening in policing disproportionately related to all the numbers that they're seeing where Black people are disproportionately not only affected by COVID, but are also disproportionately dying in COVID. And how that is related to not only the criminal justice, um, structural racism in the criminal justice system and those inequalities, but those have a direct impact on health disparities, economic disparities, where people live, because the, all those issues are interconnected because we know that communities are hyper segregated than they were and a, a, a lot of this is directly related to the Jim Crow segregation that preceded the civil rights movement and that could not necessarily be undone just by the stroke of the pen. Thank you. Um, I think Michael has a follow-up on that. Michael, please. Yeah, just yeah, uh, quickly, you know, one difference I think is important to note between liberals when they talked about law and order and um, supported measures that led to increased incarceration of African-Americans uh, and conservatives did that. Is that liberals thought uh, wrongly that if they focused on law and order um, and locked up you know, uh, what they saw as violent criminals, that that would make it possible to continue to talk about you know, uh, measures to advance the majority of black people. Um, uh, that was true also of, of uh, the Congressional Black Caucus, you know, were supported. You know, James Foreman Jr. wrote about this um, in Lucky Up Our Own. Um, you know, supported some of these uh, very harsh, and now we, we see, you know, mistaken measures, uh, which increased incarceration. Um, so not to say that, um, I think it's important to realize with, you know, even though the motivations uh, of the liberals were, you know, perhaps more, we be more empathetic towards them, the, the result was, was much the same. But 
I think, you know, we see this again today when we have, we have liberals um, who are, um, you know, wanting to be very careful about not supporting law breaking because uh, they're afraid, of course, of losing um, white votes as well as uh, some other votes of some other groups. Um, and conservatives who, like, at least like Donald Trump conservatives, uh, um, who clearly are just speaking to their predominantly white base and really don't care at all uh, about advancing uh, the interests of, uh, of African Americans, uh, except once in a while they say something rhetorically about it. Thank you, Michael. That's very helpful. Um, and I think it's important for us to be able to draw these specific distinctions about how groups operate. When we think of, when we use the term liberal, for example, what does that mean in a particular historical moment? Um, and how we might map both the uh, long history of racial violence and the specific ways it manifests itself given what has come before. And so I wanna pick up on two threads of the conversation. One is this question around geographies that was raised both by Femi in, in terms of thinking about black internationalism and Robert in terms of thinking about hyper gentrification. Um, and I want to ask Zandria if you could speak a little bit about why it's important to think geographically. Why is it important for us to think in terms of chocolate cities? What does that provide for us? And what does that um, alert us to in terms of how racism is operating? Yes, I, I want to first say that place matters. So individual places matter in terms of their distinctions between each other. So Memphis is not Detroit, is not Chicago, is not Ferguson. But also in a moment like this, it's very important to think broadly about the similarities across these places, which is something that I do try to do with my co-author in the Chocolate Cities book, not only to think about what's happening in the States, but what's happening in Black places and spaces all across the world diasporically. So there are a couple of things here. One is thinking about the levels of space density to think about distinctions in places. So um, where I'm from in the South, there are lots of rural communities, smaller towns, middle-sized cities, where we see protests taking place as well, but we're not getting as much media coverage of them because they don't fit the predominant media narrative of sort of big urban, black, predominantly Black spaces. Um, but the other thing is to also think about the ways that Black people are experiencing anti-Blackness pretty much the same across cities. So no matter what these individual distinctions are, as Feynman was mentioning earlier, all of these places have received um, military equipment. Their uh, police budgets have ballooned while their education budgets, their health budgets, other kinds of things to help and promote uh, the advancement of communities as a whole have been decreased. And so the experience that people are having is very much the same across what we've called the black map. And I think predominantly you can see the sort of diasporic workings of this now as you could in, 19, in the 1960s as well, in 1968 in particular, but you can see the diasporic workings as people in Canada are saying Black Lives Matter and they're putting George Floyd and a person who has been killed in Toronto or a person who's been killed in Montreal. We are seeing that in Paris. They're putting George Floyd and a person's name who has been killed by, um, been murdered by the police in their cities. And so when you think about um, this pulsing map, we can think about this kind of urban politics locally, your local leaders, your local police commissions, your, lo your local county commission, city commissions, but we can also think about these people as sort of wielding the same kinds of anti-Black power that have been structurally put into place over the past 50 to 75 years in order to sort of police and maintain um, uh, white wealth and Black subjugation. Uh, gentrification is something that I think we should be actively thinking about as a form of violence. As all of us know about uh, Don't Mute DC and the actions that happened in the past several months around gentrification in DC. We know about the discourse of DC going from being the chocolate city to being the latte city as Black folks have been forced out of the city because of economic um, because of a variety of reasons, but in, mostly because of economic segregation and the increased prices in the city. This is something that's happening all over the country as well. 
And so when we think again about the tensions around, as Robert mentioned, pe the pandemic, people being in the house, people are already being pushed out of their spaces in a lot of ways, plus to have anti-Black police violence on top of that. It really kind of flattens some of the distinctions between places and makes them, um, the experience in all of these places seem very much the same. And that's an opportunity for connection um, and organization. Thank you, Zandria. That was, that was extremely helpful. And I think it also draws a connection to another thread of our conversation um, by your drawing attention to how media has helped us to stay connected and to create connections for movements. Um, and this is something that we discussed through the keynote lecture of Kathy Cohen in African American Studies um, this year. And I'm, I'm gonna invite Robert and Michael to respond and think with us some about the role of media. And so I have a two part question, Robert, already referenced the availability of images of black people and anti-black violence given the fact that everyone has a, a, a camera in their phone and how that might be distinctive from the 1960s. And we also know in the 1960s that civil rights activists actively used the media to advance their work. And so my first question is, um, could you talk some about the history of media and how it relates to ongoing social movements and how we might understand the importance of social media? This also came up as a question in the thread from Nicole Rizzuto. Um, you know, how, is, how can we use social media in a responsible way and engage with the media more broadly? But then the second part of my question is the assault on the media that we see taking place, the violence that we see happening to people who are reporting on, what, on the protests that are happening, what should we be thinking about in relationship to specific acts of physical violence against the media in this moment? And what is it telling us about the state of our democracy? So please, uh, Michael, would you begin? And then Robert, perhaps you could answer as well. well that's a great question. Um, by the way, I wanna thank all my panelists. I'm learning a lot. It's uh, uh, just listening to all of you. Um, well, you know, on the one hand, you know, obviously we know some of the obvious stuff about social media. You can organize demonstrations more easily. Uh, people can coordinate with one another uh, when they're at the demonstration um, and all that. I mean, that's um, pretty much, you know, uh, cliches by now. Uh, I'm struck, though, by, you know, how people are following what social movement theorists call the repertoire of social protest, um, you know, in some ways like they did 50 years ago. I mean, people want to be together, <laughs> you know, despite the... Uh, the coronavirus, which, you know, of course, might be endangering folks who go to the demonstrations. Um, but, you know, they want to go to public places. They want to uh, confront the police and tell them that this is their city, not uh, the police's city. Um, and so that's all very similar in that way to the 1960s, even though it's easier to uh, organize a demonstration within a few minutes, you know, than it would have been uh, back then. Um, so in some ways, you know, uh, uh, it's the same, but it's also different. Um, uh, I think in terms of the role of um, the, the mainstream media, you know, TV stations and the major press, um, you know, one big difference to the 60s too is that, um, you know, the, the media was then sort of coded, it was coded as mainstream, of course, but ideologically, you know, it was all over the place. You know, uh, there were ma major newspapers like Chicago Tribune, Los Angeles Times, that were conservative, there were sort of moderate liberal ones like the New York Times and the Washington Post. Uh, TV stations tried to sort of stay out. Cable hadn't happened yet, you know. But now, as we know, uh, there is conservative media, there is liberal media, there's some progressive media, uh, usually not, you know, uh, on, on mainstream television at least. Um, and when the media, the return the media now uh, for a lot of conservatives is an antagonistic um, uh, enterprise, uh, uh, whether or not, whether it's or not is a different question. Um, and of course, you know, for many people on the streets, it's not antagonistic, but they think it's also too neutral. You know, so I think uh, uh, since the 60s, this is something really began in the 60s in many ways, uh, the media has taken on sort of an ideological uh, meaning. Um, uh, remember Richard Nixon had an enemies list of people, many of whom were in the media. Uh, and people choose their media because of their politics, uh, which is something which but most of it did not happen in the 60s. Um, and that is both, you know, inevitable perhaps with all the media we have to choose from now and there's so much more uh, with the internet. On the other hand, it's also something which continues, of course, to um, drive the illogical polarization among other, among other things. So um, uh, I'm not sure we can get away from it, but it's, it's, it's the world we live in. 
Yes, thank you. And I think that, you know, the idea of how media and acts our 24 hour ability to consume media and then to self segregate into different types of viewerships is important, as opposed to the 1960s people sitting together watching the news unfold watching people um, protesting unfold is a different orientation. Um, so Robert, please, um, could you give us some insight about media, how it functions, the importance of yeah. media playing a role in movements? Yes, and also I'm going to um, I'm going to echo I'm going to diverge slightly from what Michael said to hone in on one thing, and then if it's okay with um, with you, I want to actually go back to a point about the COVID nineteen and the and the medical part of it because um, I think we'd be remiss not to at least address something slightly more specifically that's worth pointing out um, on, on this panel. So I think that one of the distinct differences is that I think Black people from experience. Um, from narratives and from history have always known and believed the police to as a, the police to sort of be corrupt to plant charges to be able to accuse them in some in many instances wrongfully and to be able to get away from it and I could imagine that in the 60s and even the 70s people probably were thinking oh if we had had some video evidence that we could show that would prove that this actually happened we would be able to kind of make our case what I think is stunning now is that evidence actually doesn't matter. And that part of what social media has been able to do has been able to record incidents and episodes that have been able to provide the evidence to show this is what happened. This is this was what happens um, more frequently than it should, that this is systemic and systematic, that this is not necessarily an isolated set of bad apples, but this is about a broader framework of policing. And so on the one hand, social media, I think, has done an important role of unearthing this violence and making it more visible and at the same time it has functioned to show that that evidence does not matter and that's partially because there's just this ongoing criminalization dehumanization of black people um, so the evidence doesn't matter right so the narrative just spins as to what to do what to do with that evidence but as far as it perhaps tipping the the uh the scale doesn't always happen I do think that's something that's distinctive about now based on what people are reporting in terms of um, allies understanding, okay, maybe I need to get this more. Uh, this is not an isolated example. Um, I think that that picture to my mind of the officer on George, on George Floyd's neck, uh, the callous indifference, I think is so emblematic of white supremacy that it is startling. Um, to people to just sort of see there, there's sort of this notion like, yeah, I'm doing this, what are you gonna do to me, right? Um, and so I think that the social media has been very um, helpful in providing the evidence. And now what I hope this turn is, is to show all the times the evidence hasn't mattered and perhaps shift the calculus so that it does. I just wanted to interject and, and um pick up on something that Robert was saying, because one of the things that happens is that we have always had witnesses, whether the witness is a camera or the witness is physical eyewitnesses, we have always had witnesses. Um, these moments all the time remind me of, uh, I had a cousin to be murdered by police when he was 16 and I was 18. And the police said that he uh, turned and, and pulled a gun on them, he was going to fire on them, and so they fired, and then when the autopsy came back, he had been shot in the back while fleeing. And there were people who witnessed that, there were people who told us that that had happened, there were witnesses there, and so those witnesses, physical live witnesses, were disbelieved in very much the same way that video is today. And so if we think about the role of social media and the role of the camera, I think we should be thinking about the eye. I think we should be thinking about witness. These are things that our curricula in the college help us do to think about it from a humanities sort of lens. What does it mean to witness in these moments? I see in the Q&A, a lot of people are asking questions about, you know, how can they be an ally or how can they be a witness and serve? Really be thinking about the the sort of Janice faceness of social media when you're posting on social media what it means to post videos of protesters uh, TLDR don't do it <laughs> um, what surveillance means in the context of our all seeing eyes on our cameras what surveillance means in the, in the context of our data being used and I think in general we have to be sort of mindful of the fact that the no matter what we have always had witnesses 
the camera is not necessarily a better eye in terms of convincing folks who want who want to engage in anti-black violence who want to engage in murder with impunity that's it's an epistemological problem they're not they're not going to witness in that same way and i would just i thank you for that zandra because i would just call forth again um, the brilliant James Baldwin, who described part of his role in the civil rights movement was to bear witness. And in doing that, he was not simply suggesting that he was going to describe what had transpired, but rather he was trying to raise the moral and ethical stakes of what was happening as a way to allow people to see the ramifications of anti-Black violence um, that he saw as the ongoing cancer and virus of America. And so when we think about witnessing, it's not simply about being able to display, but it's also about giving a insight into the dynamics that are animating what is happening in this moment and one's ability or inability to see that clearly. Um, and so I appreciate that. And I, I think echoing um, on some of the questions in the chat, I wanna invite Femi, and this is our last question, and then I'll answer questions in the chat more specifically. But one of the things that has been raised is, um, you know, what can we do? And is there a list of resources or a reading list that you would suggest um, for further study and for further consideration? And so, Femi, I'm wondering how the history of Black thought, what the history of Black thought teaches us with regards to visions for dismantling institutional racism? And is there something or a few things specifically you, you would suggest one runs and reads as soon as we end? the teaching. Thanks for that question. Um, I think the history of Black thought teaches us um, that oppression is as large as the world. Um, the structures that we're talking about um, are the, just are the very structures that structure social reality the plantations were the Southern economy. They were not a feature of the Southern economy. Um, slavery was constitutive of the Southern economy. Um, the slave trade built the world economy. Um, and I think we have to think at that scale if we wanna understand what we're trying to accomplish and what we're responding to. So as far as specific things we could read to analyze things like police violence and the militarization of the police and mass incarceration with that scale in mind. Um, one of the best texts um, that I've ever read on the subject was actually written right after the tumult of 1968 um, by a Black Studies professor named Robert Allen. It's called Black Awakening in Capitalist America. Um, and what it describes is all of the forces that combined to make the institutional response, both within um, Black radicals who had one set of goals and within um, the government, which had a markedly different set of goals, but all the forces that combined to make those responses what they were. Um, and of course, um, private capital and philanthropic foundations, which turned out to be central to the story as he tells it. Um, but beyond that, um, beyond um, that kind of historical example, I actually would encourage people to look into two um, kind of contemporary things in um, sort of radical left thought that seem like appropriate ways of starting to thinking, starting to think about long-term responses to these structural um, aspects of violence. Um, one is, um, community control over the police. So a lot of people are talking about defunding the police, and I think that is um, a smart demand and it's clear headed. Um, but I think, um, again, we need scale is something that we need to think of here. Um, the police budgets are actually a symptom of a deeper political problem, which is the political alignment of the people who are supposed to be regulating and constraining the police um, and stopping them from committing violence um, and the people who enable them to do those things. But in fact, if we look at how our laws are structured, if we look at how capital is structured, 
The prison industrial complex is a $182 billion industry, the vast majority of which is run through public institutions. Private prisons are less than 5% of this. Um, so there's a complete collusion between um, the people who service um, police departments and prisons, providing them with weaponry, food, so on and so forth, and the lawmakers who are supposed to be preventing all these same institutions from committing abuses. Um, so we need something, I think, that structures the political relationships a bit more deeply than just making that toxic political mass of relationships smaller. We need a completely different orientation to the police. And so while I think defund, defunding the police is onto something, I think what we need to push for is community control over the police. Um, and that brings me to the second thing. How are we going to get the bargaining power to do this? If corporations and government officials are all lined up um, against the people on this, if Freddie Gray can be tortured to death um, with a black state attorney general and a black president and a black um, attorney general of the Department of Justice um, and a black mayor of a black city, all of whom are Democrats, then I think we have a problem of confronting power. Um, and one model that people are starting to talk about for doing that is a model that's called bargaining for the common good, which is when um, workers, organized workers, so unions um, co-construct demands and fight for demands together with community organizations. Um, and SEIU local did this earlier this year and fought for um, climate demands um, using this organizing model. And I think it's something to look into and think about. Um, it's, of course, too early to say whether any one tactic is the answer. But I think this is the kind of thing we need to think about if we want to genuinely confront these institutions and confront power in the only language which it understands, which is power. Thank you, Femi. That was extremely helpful. And I want to now turn to the questions that have been posed in the Q&A. Um, I just want to say that I appreciate um, how many questions we've received. I'm going to try to move through them as quickly as possible. But I also wanted to note that Vice President Rosemary Kilkenny plans to convene um, a series of conversations along these similar lines. And so we also hope to follow up um, with any questions that we can't answer in this forum. And so I want to begin by combining a few questions, which are really, I think, at their heart about specific guidance of how to move forward. And so two of them, one is about, two of them are about a question of scale. Um, and the question is, you know, what an individual person can do, particularly one that's immunocompromised or living with someone who's immunocompromised, um, if they don't feel comfortable going out to protest. And the other one is about how to, um, reform structures and institutions in America. And so one about individual action, the other one about larger structures. And Femi's last comment gave us a roadmap with regards to policing or began to give us a roadmap along those lines. But I wonder if anyone else or Femi would like to say more about this distinction in terms of scale, but then also specific guidance about how to move forward in terms of individual action and then structural reform. Yes, Michael, please. Yeah, um, it's a huge question, of course, and a vital one. Well, individually, you know, people should do whatever they feel comfortable doing, I think. Uh, that's, you know, history of social movement shows, you know, if you ask people to do things that they don't feel comfortable doing, they won't do them. So, you know, give money to Black Lives Matter groups, give money to bail funds, uh, um, you know, join demonstrations if you feel, you know, you can do it safely. Um, um, and, um, and certainly put together your organization, your institution, if you have one, with other community institutions the kind of thing, uh, that, that, that the family just, just discussed and talk about demands. Um, uh, but of course, communities are complicated, you know. Uh, I live in a gentrified community in DC in Adams Morgan, you know, where, you know, there's many, many different, community is, uh, you know, <laughs> is a loaded word. So uh, um, on the other hand, you know, I, I believe uh, that history changes in this country at least, when you have, when social movements have an inside and outside strategy. I think that's what Dr. King had, I think. I think that's what uh, um, uh, labor movement, when it was a radical labor movement had, that's what the feminist movement had, LGBT movement had. Um, 
I, I think so. Um, you know, as much as I'm critical of Democrats and as as, as uh, the failures of the Obama administration, you know, unless we have um, a, a different party in charge of the federal government, um, um, there'd be no possibility of some of the changes we're talking about happening. So the first thing is, yeah, people got to vote, uh, and they got to vote for a different party. Um, um, but the, obviously, that's not enough, um, as we know, because in the 60s, of course, there was a liberal party in, in power and things were falling apart. Um, so, you know, I think um, on the one hand, people have to keep uh, organizing social movements, which are as inclusive as possible, uh, make demands, which are both visionary on one hand, but also uh, include ones that are possible to win uh, on the other hand. Um, and they have to uh, both pressure the government and, you know, and work when they can with those uh, in power. Um, because you, either, either in becoming co-opted by the government is, is a problem, but then seeing yourself at all, all points opposed to those in the government is also, I think, a problem. Because in the end, you know, uh, we have a government, it's going to pass laws or not pass laws. It's going to um, uh, try to do away with, you know, uh, the militarization of the police or not. Um, and these are policy issues which um, we as citizens of this country can have an impact on. And you can have an impact on these policy decisions, both by going to the streets and by voting for different politicians. And then as politicians get in power, if they win, putting continued pressure on them. Um, so, you know, maybe this is sort of a politics 101, but I think it's essential not to sort of put all our eggs in one basket, uh, so to speak. Definitely, inside outside uh, strategy is really important. Robert? So in uh, Tony K. Bambara's essay on the issue of roles, part of what she talks about is that revolution begins by interrogating the self um, or, or transforming the self. And so one place I think of, of to, to be, perhaps begin some of this work is to think about where we as individuals have power, influence, uh, in, in those type of relationships because, you know, it could be something as simple as, you know, do I have a do I have a understanding an understanding of racism that adequately grasps its complexities, right? Do I have an understanding of institutional racism? Um, what does allyship work like, right? What does it, I'm sorry, what does it look like, and how does it work? When I'm in spaces where, so I may not be in the government, right? But I might be in the classroom, for example, and so what type of community might I be cultivating to make my um, students uh, who are black in this instance or whatever the case might be, feel that this is an empowered place to speak? Um, how do I receive knowledge from those students that then allows me to rethink about my approach to pedagogy? When I'm in a faculty meeting, how is it that I listen to or hear voices that I'm not, I'm not necessarily used to speaking, right? So there, I guess there's a place in, in the micro politic in the individual that is influenced by and related to the systemic um, in the institution. And I think that if we can have those difficult conversations with ourselves, that might position us in a place to have this other movement um, that I think is, is necessary. And I totally agree with Michael about the voting and, and those larger scale issues of contributing money, but, but this interrogation of the self, my shortcomings, my biases, my limited sightings, um, and how those actually may play out in a very large way, right? And have significant consequences um, because I do actually have power and influence even if it's not within the government or even if it's not um, in a position um, whose title signifies that. Thank you. And I just um, wanted to know, Femi, if you could speak a little bit more, um, if you have more to say about the bargaining for the common good idea that you introduced, which I think is really powerful. And I think it would also help us to respond to um, a question from one of our students, Kai, who asks, although Black students have access to elite universities, we still see the over-policing of Black bodies, both by GUPD as well as the Metropolitan Police Department. What methods can we use to um, make sure that all students feel safe? And so this is a microcosm, obviously, this larger question around the militarization of our police forces. Um, it's an important question. I think one thing is uh, a campaign, something like um, what was done at Johns Hopkins um, and 
as the University of Minnesota seems to be considering. So in response to the um, uprising, in response to the murder of George Floyd, uh, Minnesota public schools canceled their contract with the police. Um, and University of Minnesota seems to be um, at least in the process of thinking over that sort of thing and a campaign to pressure um, institutions to fundamentally change their relationship or abolish their relationship with the police um, seems like um, the right kind of step in that direction. But, you know, as Michael rightly says, you have to be realistic about how it is that you get changes like that made. Um, regardless of what your moral or symbolic or um, emotional relationship to the fact of um, government existing or laws existing and those things structuring social reality, laws are gonna do what they're gonna do, right? Um, the government's here, at least for now. So how do you respond to that in an effective way? And I think um, the people that have advanced um, the community control over the police demand have been um, quite realistic about what that looks like. Um, while, you know, their politics might have a deeper antagonism to state power behind it, the actual um, demand for community control over the police in the case of, for example, Pan-African Community Action, or PACA, um, was for a ballot initiative um, to educate people and put the, you know, work through the formal system to advance this particular demand in a tactical fashion, right? So I um, com completely agree that we should have a realistic relationship to the institutions that we're trying to change because we have to change the actual institutions, not just um, our relationship to them. So to just say quickly um, a little bit more about bargaining for the common good. So. Um, the KI initiative at Georgetown is contributing to a broader effort by unions um, and other centers, um, research centers at universities to put together a map of contract expirations throughout the country. Um, and in fact, the first version of this map is already publicly available. I believe if you go to forgeorganizing.org, you can see it. Um, and what having that information allows people to do is begin the process of approaching unions whose contracts are going to expire, which means that they're going to go into another round of negotiations with corporations, which are an unelected part of political power structure that we also need to grapple with, right? Um, and the idea is if community, organ if community organizations um, or political organizations, um, I shouldn't say or, and, Right. Um, the, um, for example, in the Minnesota climate strike, there were aligned um, youth climate organizers and indigenous organizations that helped craft the green demands there. Um, but the idea is if there's someone in your area who's about to face a contract negotiation, um, it should be the community um, lining up to the extent possible against the corporation on the other side. And Michael's right. We have to be realistic about what that looks like. Not all communities look the same. Um, people living near each other doesn't mean that their politics are aligned, but there's no other way that politics works other than, you know, having an agenda, pushing for it, trying to get people on your side. Um, the difference under this model is that we have um, a larger pool of people facing a corporation than just the individual workers who it employs. Thank you, Sammy. That's really helpful. And I think, you know, another piece of that as we're thinking about um, collective work, um, our colleague Coylin asked in the, in the Q&A about protests that are happening abroad and drawing attention to the internationalism of the protests that are occurring. And certainly we can think some again, as Zandri had already offered for us to think geographically. Um, and so I wonder if we, and another part I want to link this to is questions that have come up in the chat about thinking about the economic stakes of what are happening. And so how do we think about collectivity? How do we think about capitalism? How is the history of capitalism and its links to slavery useful in this moment? So I know that's a lot, but I wonder if Zandria, you can just talk briefly about sort of the longer history, you know, predating the civil rights movement um, and how it might help us to understand systems that they're unfolding and also possibilities for connection. 
Um, I just want to underscore something that Robert was talking about when he referenced Tony K. Bumbar's essay. I think as much as we know that there are constraints within our current political system, we must employ a radical imagination. You have got to imagine something far beyond anything that we have imagined before, because that is how it has happened um, in, in previous times. Even if we want to think about something like the labor movement, Michael referenced earlier, that it, the labor movement was radical um, at first, and uh, unions was a radical proposition. It got us the work days that we have, it got us a lot of the things that we have, and these were in some cases, multiracial, even if they were segregated, there were multiracial demands coming together, people coming together to demand better economic opportunities, more safe conditions. This is something that, that we can do. And if we think about the history of race as intersecting with these economic opportunities, let's just think about uh, the case of, of Plessy versus Ferguson in New Orleans. People were going to shut down Laborers are going to shut down the city of New Orleans. And there was a multiracial coalition of people. Power said, uh-uh, <laughs> no, y'all don't get together and shut down this city. And these are the, this is the kind of context in which Plessy is happening. So there's always some underlying economic pressure that we as laborers and workers can bring to the fore in order to be able to push the boundaries a little bit further. Uh, another thing I want us to do is to go back into recent history and think about the Occupy movement. It um, is lambasted sometimes in the media as not having, uh, you know, any real force or any real meaning, but it did push parties further a little bit to thinking about um, economic opportunities and at least change the rhetoric and the discourse. This is yet another opportunity because we know what's happening underlying this, underlying uh, the anti-Black racism that is always already ongoing. And this pandemic is that economic violence that has significantly increased as our wealth, wealth gap has increased, as conditions for laborers have become more and more and more unsafe. And so if we think about the intersections of racism and capitalism, and then also gender and sexuality and sort of how people are experiencing labor, economic constraints and economic opportunities today, I think that gets us a little bit further in terms of what we can imagine um, for, for the future. And the legacy of slavery continues today in these economically, um, in these constrictions, in the way that our system is stratified. If we can continue to remember that moment and then to remember all the subsequent moments where there were pushes and movements beyond where we were before, I think we can get something a little bit more uh, imaginative about what could be possible for us going forward. I agree and I think that one of the questions that came up in the chat and I know we're running out of time, but it was about us I'm more explicitly speaking to how COVID plays a role in this conversation. I think one of the points that is underlying what Zandria just said is thinking about how access to healthcare, the structures that then produce um, diagnoses with regards to healthcare, and the ways that we know different populations manifest disease differently is an important part. And so, Robert, I'll let you speak to that really quickly before we have to go. Yeah, so quickly, I would just say that. A lot of the conversations um, have been even coming out of his, the histor historically out of the civil rights movement, and what you're, you're saying is about that you know access to um, access, right? And we need to talk more and think more about the outcome as well, which is to say, even when Black people have access to quality health care, their outcomes are different, and the neutralizing force seems to be about part of how race structures the interpersonal interaction um, in the medical setting. And so I just, I just think it's very important to think about once there's access, what other mechanisms are in place to ensure outcomes? Um, and we can take that from the medical venue and extrapolate to Georgetown or anywhere else that it might be applicable. Thank you. I know that we are out of time, um, but I appreciate all the questions in the chat. And I know that one homework assignment that we were given as a panelist is to come up with a list of suggested readings. So I will try to shepherd that project forward and share it with our guests. I once again want to thank um, UIS, the College of Arts and Scientists, and our panelists for this discussion. And I look forward to future convenings with Georgetown. 
but we know that these conversations are just the beginning. We also have to implement what we've, what we've learned. So thank you. Have a good afternoon.